So first of all, I'd like to thank Sam for giving us, us the, me and the panel, this great slot, the graveyard slot. <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, I said to this to one of our panelists, and she said, no, 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 it's fine. They saved the best to last. So <laughs> let's hope so. So thank you for all being here for this session, the last one, and for being awake. Um, and I'm going to do my best to really keep you awake. Uh, the topic we're discussing is interesting and really important. Um, as uh, Sam said, we're going to be discussing this very simple little question. Are cows killing the planet? And this is really important for us to get to grips with, not just in this room, but as a society. Because all of our discussions that we've been having so far in this conference about whether eating meat is good for us or not, how much should we be eating, the kind of conditions that may be helped by that, and all of the experience that all, some of you might have in this room, um, curing certain conditions, reversing things but with meat-heavy diets, all of those will be moot unless we are able to reassure ourselves to explain to ourselves to understand the reality of what cows are really doing to the planet because we will not be given that choice if we if we can't counter that narrative which is really out there and dominant and this was brought home to me when um, I think Dr. Ede, I don't know if she's still here but this morning she uh, mentioned somebody called Jan Ellison who runs metabolic who founded metabolic minds and Jan Ellison has a sort of 20s son, age son, who had bipolar disorder and who cured that by uh, eating a very meat-heavy ketogenic diet. And Jan went to a conference at the White House, which was all about m the role of meat in society and, and diet and healthy diets and environment and everything together. And she was sitting next to a scientist, and she somehow must have got into conversation about this ketogenic diet, meat heavy, etc. And the scientist said to her, well, that's just immoral. You, you can't possibly recommend that. You can't possibly do that. And Jan said, why? And uh, the scientist said, well, because it's the number one killer of the planet, meat. So Jan went away and was baffled and also very worried and she contacted me and a couple of other people in this space to find out more about the reality of what cows are doing to the planet because she is terrified that her son will no longer have access at some point in time to this food which has been curative for him for him um, so for me, that's, that's why this is important that we, that we get to grips with it. It doesn't really matter whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat, whether you do better on more plants or less plants. Um, what matters is that people have the choice to do what they need for their own health and their bodies, their genetic disposition, etc. cetera. So um, we're going to talk about this question and we're going to try to address some of the nuances that are involved. So when we talk about cows killing the planet, what do we mean? What do we, what do we hear? And in case you've forgotten what the charges are against cows, I'm going to tell you. They're all up here. There's five main areas. Yes, I can't see that either. No. <laughs> so I'm going to look up here if that's okay. Um, no, because I can't see, you can't hear me. Um, so first of all, the number one charge is that cows emit emissions, methane emissions. Now, the numbers you'll see up here range from anything from, say, 11 to 19 percent from the FAO of the United Nations through to numbers like 50 percent of total emissions, which came from a movie called Cowspiracy that many of you might have seen uh, back in 2015 and continues to have a huge influence over the debate, unfortunately. There are lots of um, environmental scientists who also tout that 50 percent figure because they insist that we need to be taking into account all the opportunity costs of all the land that is used for cows, and we need to sort of double, double up the numbers, as it were. So we have that charge, and I think, I'm hoping that with the panel, we can get into some of the nuances that we need to recognize about those numbers and understand why there are such disparate 
disparate es estimates, although the FAO's recent estimate is 11% of emissions from, are from livestock. The, um, the next most frequently um, levied charge is that uh, cows represent a very inefficient use of land because they use 80% or almost 80% of uh, agricultural land, but they deliver just 18% of the calories. So I'll, I'll leave that fact with you. You can judge whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, or whether there might be other things that we need to be considering there. Biodiversity loss is another charge. It is, it is believed that, and it is a fact, that domesticated animals now outweigh um, in terms of um, the space they take and the, their bulk on the planet outweigh wild animals. That is a fact. The question is, what do we do about it? And those who would like to see livestock eradicated insist that we must rewild a significant chunk of our agricultural land in order to hand it back to, to the wild animals and, and wild species, wild fauna, and to regenerate ecosystems. So that's another big chunk of where the debate is. Connected with that is the whole deforestation issue, the charge being that we are growing feed, such as soy and corn, on deforested land and feeding it to cows, and then they only provide 18% of our calories. So those, all those arguments are tied together in a way. And then there's something we don't hear about quite so often anymore, which is the whole water use issue. It used to be um, much more hotly debated, the fact that allegedly um, uh, raising a pound of beef requires 15,000 liters of water. Um, so, uh, but, it, but it's less often talked about. I think that most often the charges are centering around the GHG emissions, land use, and biodiversity. So those are the charges. Now, on the face of it, they're pretty damning. And actually, if you take all of those asserted facts at face value, I think you might well conclude that we really ought to be weaning ourselves off meat and, and get rid of the cows. But as with many things, there are nuances that we need to consider. There are also um, many facts which are asserted to support those claims which are misleading or even incorrect. And so we're going to try and explore that today. Some of you may know that I had a go at exploring that in this book, which came out last year. And um, I've been lucky to talk to a, quite a number of people here about that book uh, upstairs. Um, so I was really just trying to look at the nuances and look at some of the counter arguments and, and put a fair case, as it were, for a world in which we continue to eat an omnivore diet. Um, and that's really what we're going to do today, and I don't have to do it by myself right now. So I am going to be assisted by this uh, very able panel. And at the moment, I'm just going to... Um, hand over to them to introduce themselves so that you know what perspective they're bringing, what their work is, and how it might add to, to this debate. Thank you, Jane. My name is Sheila Cook, and I'm the hub leader for 3LM, which stands for Land and Livestock Management for Life. We are the hub in the UK and Ireland for the Savory uh, Network, part of the Savory Institute. And many of you have told me you you know about Alan Savory, and you have watched his TED Talk. And I have to say, this is a first for me, and I go to lots of farm conferences, and nobody's ever heard of him. And it's wonderful to have met so many fans of Alan Savory and the work of holistic management. And for those who don't know what is holistic management, it's a framework for decision making that enables people to integrate their economic, social, and ecological outcomes in their decision making and planning. And it's a, a learning process that enables all of us to do that. And what got me into it, uh, my husband Christopher is in the audience, and our work really is around human emergence. And it's about supporting and helping humans to adapt to our ever um, more complex life conditions through what we call human emergence. And humans have been doing this for millennia. And 
holistic management is just a fantastic framework that enables humans to open up into a new worldview that enables us to actually solve all the wicked problems that we face today. And on a personal level, I was vegan for 13 years, first for health reasons um, and then for planetary health reasons. And um, in 2014, um, my husband said, oh, we got to do this holistic management stuff. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, we got to start working with livestock. And I said, you mean we got to start working with the enemy? And I said, what? And he said, here, watch this video. So I watched Alan's video. Literally two days later, we applied to become a hub. And a year later, I started eating meat again. Hello everyone, thanks so much for watching Alan's TEDx. I want you to watch mine now. Because um, he's got millions of views and I've only got 3,000, so you can help to boost that up. My name's Finlow Costain. Uh, I'm now the editor of 8.9.com, which is 8.9 hectares. 8.9 hectares is the average size of a farm around the world, which is why we chose that. It's a brand new multimedia news channel, um, which sort of brings together uh, things like webinars and TV news along with articles. And we have created created this channel, which is focused on land use, that's the common theme for farming, for fiber, uh, for nutrition, for natural capital, for investment, for a whole range of different things, because there is this narrative that ruminants are destroying the planet, that farmers are the enemy, when actually we know that there is a climate crisis, we know that there is a biodiversity crisis, and we know that even if we sort electricity and energy and transportation, we're still screwed, frankly, if we don't sort the land. Land is the critical factor. And farmers and foresters and other people who own land and manage land, they are the absolute heroes we need to save us uh, as a species, um, continuing to exist in the way that we want to in the future. So that's what 8.9 is. Um, I used to, well, I still produce the Farmgate podcast, which is part of, um, uh, part of 8.9 now, and there's uh, a fabulous uh, discussion in there with somebody called Jane Buxton about a book called The Plant-Based Con. So, so do have a, ha have a look out for that. Prior to that, I was chief executive of Farmwell, which was a, a think tank which was set up post-Brexit to try and work within that framework with the government to try and identify opportunities to reform land use. And I spend a lot of time talking to governments here. I spend a lot of time prior to that talking to governments in the European Union about various different factors. Um, we have advised the Committee on Climate Change and DEFRA and Business Energy and Industrial Strategy on how to deal with um, agricultural greenhouse gases. We've run workshops for them about ruminant methane. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about you know methane in a short while. They get it, they understand it, they're just not doing what they need to with it. Um, and uh, on the program, I'm down for the Food and Global Security Network, which was a network that I founded with various different people from around the world who are concerned not just about food security, but how food contributes to civil security, to international security. And we've seen, you know, with the war in Ukraine, we've seen, um, you know, part of the reasoning behind the war in Ukraine, I'm sure, is the fact that it's not just that Putin has a stranded, you know, some stranded assets. He's got a stranded economy. It's all built on fossil fuels. The next biggest export they have is grain. If they have Ukraine, then they're a much more serious commodity player. So these things are going to shape the world, shape our geopolitics in the future. And then finally, my TEDx is called, and please make a note, I'm going to give you a chance to get your pencils out. It's called, uh, We Can't Solve the Climate Crisis Without Cows, which which gives you a clue as to where I'm coming from. <laughs> Thanks, Finlow. I'm a very boring academic from Newcastle University compared to, to uh, my other panelists. And I was a bit bothered in the list that Jane put up about the, the negative attributes of our cows. My research interest didn't feature there, which is the nutritional quality of the food that our cows produce, the milk and the meat. Um, and I'm, uh, my research is looking at how we feed our animals and the impact that has on the nut nutrition of, or sorry, our nutrition as consumers. Um, and the findings 
largely uh, reinforced that our cows ought to be eating grass, which is how they evolved. Grass and diverse pasture, and the more grazing that we can get into our animals, the better the products for our health. And um, I think whether cows are killing the planet, I'm mo more focusing on are the cows killing us, and it depends how, the, how they're managed, I would say. And hopefully we'll discuss that later. We will. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, I'm Angus Dalton. I'm a dairy farmer, uh, farm and family farm. Uh, we're tenants on a farm south end of the Peak District, so only 40 odd miles from here. Um, a, holy, a fully grass fed dairy farm. Our cows are 100% grass fed. I've been through the motions of being um, a conventional farmer, if you like. I came into the industry as a new entrant. My background, well, background, I, my father was a butcher, I lived brought up in the middle of, um, in the middle of a large town. But anyway, um, and through my education and what's been thrown at it, yes, I've, I've, I've followed the conventional line, but actually taking a step back now, and thinking outside the box. Uh, my son's come into the business uh, looking mainly after the cows. My daughter's come into the business and she's spearheaded, if you like, a diversification. Um, pr pr and we're, we're producing um, milk, butter, cheese, and ice cream. Um, so, yeah, following on from the last, <laughs> following on from the last discussion, um, I sort of feel a bit of a pariah, um, you know. My, my Mr. Whippy van's parked outside and I'm ready to... <laughs> yeah. But no, joking aside, um, 10, 12 years ago, we took um, a radical move. We were, we were farming, suing myself, um, not making any money just literally treading water, which is the story you hear so often about all these farmers. And I will cut, you know, I say whinging farmers. It, it really, it does really great on me, but I was, I was one of them once, if you like. Yeah, you were working all the hours God sends um, and not making any money. We took our foot off the gas and we, we just took a step back from it all. Um, somebody actually said to us, um, a good friend who was a consultant at the time, got three little words for you, once a day. And we thought it was mad bonkers. You know, conventional thinking just doesn't say you get less milk out of your cows, but we did. Once a day milking, 100% grass fed. Um, and interesting talking to someone earlier about the mental health um, uh, discussion this morning. Um, the whole stress has gone out of the system now. And we feel what we're doing um, is right for us, right for the cows, right for the planet. And the question is, are cows killing the planet? Well, they're certainly not. You know, so I, I'm going to ask everybody. The field, yeah. That cow is not killing the planet. It is how that cow is managed. Okay. So I'm here as your uh, cow manager today. So <laughs> any cow management questions, by all means, fire away. Good. So, Angus, you started us off on our very first question, because before we get into the nitty-gritty about methane and land use and all, all of those other topics which I raised, I want to give everyone a chance to just answer the question, are cows killing the planet from the sort of 20,000 feet level? Give me in a minute or less your answer. Now, do you have anything to add to the answer you just gave, which was no? Sorry. <laughs> No. <laughs> but what I will say is just bear in mind those cows are part of a natural carbon cycle. They are natural. The animals themselves. Do you want me to answer it? We've, we've heard over the last couple of days about the importance of the balance of the fats in our diet, the omega-3 and omega-6. And somebody mentioned um, in the last session about the long chain omega-3 fats which are actually not essential and we can um, synthesize those ourselves but only if our system is not swamped with omega-6. If we feed the cows correctly we have the correct balance and Angus's cows are probably producing milk which has got more 
omega-3 in it than omega-6 from our research, um, and that will help balance the diet and not kill us as part of the planet. Are cows destroying the planet? The food industry is part of destroying the planet. The meat industry is part of destroying the planet. If it's talking about climate change, it's fossil fuels that are destroying the planet. It's not the cow. It's, it's the how, not the cow, which is the, the basic message you know, that we put out. Cows are not the destroyer. Cows are an essential, integral part of our ecology. Not everywhere, but in many places where there are grasslands. We need cows in order to deliver the biodiversity regeneration that we need to see, to, to deliver the climate mitigation and the adaptation that we need, as well as to support uh, diets, to support livelihoods, to support economies. Cows are super important, and we'll, you know, we'll talk more about that. Cows are Earth's natural regenerators, and they're absolutely essential for um, healthy biodiversity on planet Earth. So let's just look at carbon to start with. So why do we have a carbon problem? It's because there's carbon pockets or pools of carbon in different places, in the soils, in the atmosphere, in the oceans. And through our management of land, um, including um, urbanization, including agriculture, including desertification, we have mined carbon out of soils into Earth's atmosphere, and Earth's atmosphere can no longer hold the amount of carbon that's coming off of the land, and it's going into the oceans. So there's this big imbalance of carbon. And so what is absolutely essential is that we draw the carbon back into the soils. And we have desertified planet Earth as humans to such an extent that five billion hectares of land are desertified. It means they can't grow things anymore where it could before. And so what we, what's absolutely essential is to restore soil health. Um, and in order to restore soil health, that takes plants. Plants are what photosynthesize and convert sunlight and air and water and minerals into what we call liquid carbon. And liquid carbon is the energy that feeds all life. And so about 30, 40% of that liquid carbon is going to grow the plants above the soil. About 30% of that liquid carbon is growing the root structure. And another 30% of that liquid carbon is being squirted out by the plant roots and feeding all life in the soil. And there's more life in the soil than there is above the earth. So all life depends upon, upon the life that's in the soil. Now the question is, what do those plants need in order to be healthy? And what they need is a herbivore, wild or domesticated. They need a herbivore to keep them healthy, to keep them growing, um, to eat them, to trample them, to lie down on them, um, to keep them uh, having a life cycle. And so when we have well-managed livestock, whether it's cattle or sheep or goats or what have you, llamas, whatever it is, they're going to be keeping the longevity of green during a growing season. And we can get multiple cycles of plant growth in a, in a season always drawing down carbon in these deep perennial plants, drawing carbon deep into the soils. And there's many, there's several kinds of carbon. There's the, the detritus on the soil, which is um, constantly changing and in flux. And then deeper within the soil is the stable carbon that's been converted by fungi. That carbon is going to stay there for a hundred years, a thousand years. We need all of that carbon in the soil. Why? First, it's feeding the soil life. Um, but secondly, that's how we get water into our soils. Okay, so one gram of carbon in the soil 
is going to hold 10 grams of water. That's, that turns soil into a moist sponge, which enables plants and all the living organisms to gain access to water when there is no rain. That's how plants are surviving, is because of the stores of fresh water in the soils. So when we desertify, we kill all of that, and earth can no longer hold the fresh water. And that becomes a problem for cooling our planet. And how a key, key, key way until the balance of carbon is restored of how we can cool our planet is through ve revegetating planet Earth. It's absolutely essential. And it can be done with livestock. Well managed livestock can um, re green planet Earth, creating a cooling effect in multiple ways. One way, just think about standing under a tree uh, in the summer and how cool it is under that tree, whereas if you stand out from away from the tree, it's going to be a lot hotter. A second way is transpiration. So when, as plants photosynthesize, they draw up moisture and run it through their the plant, and it goes out the leaves. This is called transpiration. And that has this lovely cooling effect. If any of you have ever been to a warm climate and they, you get to eat outside, the restaurants are, are spraying water down on you to cool it, cool you. That's the exact th same thing that our plants are doing. And we can have a wonderful, cool planet if we would only regreen this can be done quickly with well-managed livestock. Thank you. Thank you. That was very poetic, I thought. Uh, thank you, everybody, for answering that question. So it's very clear where people stand. And I think what I'd like to do now is dig into some of the, 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 the nitty-gritty of, of the questions about why we may be so confused. Why don't more people know this? Why don't more people know what you people have, have just told us? And where, where we need to start is why we have confusion about the emissions in the first place. So one element of confusion is, of course, these variances in the uh, estimates that I showed you. Um, but there are many other layers of confusion. So we need to clarify, how are we measuring these emissions? Um, what is it we need to account for? And what, what do we need to be aware of about the way they're being measured? And um, we can all comment on that or just a couple, but I'd like to start with Finlo, please. Thanks. Um, it's such a big, you know, I could spend an hour talking about this and it's, it's such a big subject. <laughs> um, and, and I think the place to probably start is with, you know, some of the statistics that Jane was sticking up there before. If we look at the UK agricultural emissions, 60% of those emissions are from methane, okay? So that sounds bad, right? But we need to understand the difference between an emission and global warming. Okay, because not all emissions are the same, but all emissions have been treated the same until relatively recently. So if you think about carbon dioxide, this can exist in the atmosphere for up to a thousand years, warming our atmosphere. There is a direct correlation between uh, a ton of, uh, of CO2 being emitted and the warming that it continues and continues and continues to emit. Nitrous oxide can exist in the atmosphere for, uh, for 500 years, doing a similar thing. So in terms of our lives, it, you know, it's, it's essentially forever. Um, methane has a half-life of about 10 years. After 20 years, almost all of its warming impact has disappeared. So if you've got a herd of 100 cows or a herd of a million cows, it doesn't really matter. Once you've had them for 20 years, their emissions continue, but there's no new additional warming coming from that herd. And because our herd has dropped significantly in the UK by about 15% or so over the last 20 years, um, we're already below net zero warming in terms of ruminants in the UK. Now, that's not a message you're going to hear from The Guardian very often, but it's, it's really important. And, and, and we have a metric. So the way that this this challenge, this misunderstanding has arisen is because we've been using a metric globally called GWP100. GWP100 is the way that we assess the impact of greenhouse gases. Now, GWP100 is fine when it comes to carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, but it doesn't accurately characterize stable emissions 
of short-lived gases. Now, methane coming out of the back end or the front end of a cow is a stable emission of a short-lived gas, and that's completely different. You may have seen on the front page of The Guardian a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, there are two oil um, uh, installations in Turkmenistan that are just flaring constantly, or, or emitting constantly, they don't flare anymore. And they are providing more warming impact simply from those two oil installations than the whole of the UK. So are cows the problem? No, they're not. And GWP 100 has misled us for a long time. What GWP star does, this is a revised metric that came out of Oxford University about three or four years ago uh, from a research team led by Professor Miles Allen, uh, who's just been honored. He's just become a, uh, a fellow of the Royal Society, I think. Uh, he's a, a member, you know, he, he's part of the IPCC. He's the senior intergovernmental panel on climate change researcher. And this is his research. And the IPCC has accepted that the current metric, GWP 100, overstates the impact of stable sources of ongoing emissions, our cow burps and farts, by a factor of three to four. It's three to four times wrong. But importantly, it also shows that new sources of emissions, in other words, if we increased the global herd of cattle, then that would have, uh, then it, uh, it, it underestimates the impact of that by a factor of four to five. So it shows us that whichever way we look at it, the current metric is incorrect. GWP star corrects that, and when we do a carbon footprint on a farm, uh, using GWP star, the values for carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide will remain the same, but in terms of the methane impact, that will drop standardly by about 70%, okay, which gives you a clue as to, uh, as to how unimportant that is. Now, methane is still a really significant greenhouse gas, and we have to acknowledge that, but it's a question of where those sources are. And I talked about fossil fuels before. Fossil methane, methane that's coming from under the ground, which is, uh, you know, a millions of years cycle. That's a problem. That's driving global warming. Methane that's in loop after 20 years in terms of our herd of cattle, that's not an issue. But it's important that we understand that because when we are not sidelined by methane, we can start taking the fossil fuel impact of uh, the carbon dioxide and the nitrous oxide out of agriculture. And when I talk about the cow, not the how, if you think about a beef feedlot in the United States, and that's just, it's a really bad system. But it's not a bad system because of the cow, it's a bad system because there isn't a tree or a blade of grass, that the feed and water has to be imported, that the feed has probably come from places you know, that have been deforested in one way or another in order to produce the soy that's necessary to go into that feed, as opposed to the system that Angus has, you know, where you have a regenerative system where you have cows that are, um, that are pooing and weeing and trampling that into the soil, creating this incredible function uh, that we were talking about, uh, uh, making sure that the soil is working, that the water is cycling. Uh, and if we have a system like that, we create more biomass, more grass, which creates more of the hydroxyls that clean the air and help to take the methane out of it. But we also need methane because it has really important functions in the soil. It's not there for no reason. So we have these naturally cycling systems, regenerative systems, agroecological systems. You have some fantastic stuff going on in terms of ecology because of the cattle. So that's where we need to get to. We need to get from the systems where we're using industry to produce food to systems where we're going back to farming to produce food. And GWP star, gives us a really big clue about how to, how to do that. Angus, you want to say something? That's fine, but even GWP star doesn't um, put the whole thing into context. We're talking about emissions, 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 and actually really what should be being taken account of is the actual warming effect. You touched on it. Um, my gut feeling is, is the narrative that out there, that, that's out there is actually what's confusing everybody. And I think there's economic drivers, there's political drivers. Um, yeah, and they're quite happy to see the confusion. You know, you can put the top of that list, the fossil fuel industry, along with this, 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 this general um, uh, policy makers 
line from government coming out that yes we've got to reach net zero and yes we've got to have growth how can you have growth if you're reaching net zero you know there's a whole load of things going on behind the scenes here um and and that's what's confusing people and confusing people in you know in their minds and and yeah journalism mainstream media you drive through the middle of manchester and manchester city council is quite happily telling us that we you know we should be eating less meat and dairy to save the planet Fine, eat less meat and dairy if you want, but it's not going to save the planet. But Manchester City Council have got it in their mind that that's what's going to save the planet. The narrative is wrong behind all this somewhere, and it's bigger forces than just, just us. And I'm just speaking as a farmer. I'm not a scientist by any means. And I really don't know where to start on challenging this narrative, but hopefully... Um, It'll, it'll, it'll make you guys here today just open your eyes and question. Question what's been thrown at you. When I look at papers on this, um, it's just a numbers game, and I've talked to people who've had to write these papers, and they talk about how hard it is to, to quantify the carbon and methane emissions. And... Uh, that makes me just want to take a step back. And it's not just a numbers game because we're dealing with something incredibly complex, this, you know, Earth's uh, biosphere and how animals interact with everything. And so when livestock have this ability to um, regenerate the planet and what happens when they're grazing is that they're keeping um, photosynthesis happening. And one of the things that happens in photosynthesis is transpiration. When the transpiration interacts with sunlight, then hydroxyl radicals are created in Earth's atmosphere. And uh, cows have the ability to create photooxidation services with these hydroxyl radicals that are 100 times the methane that they generate. So the hydroxyl radicals in Earth's atmosphere are there for cleaning toxins out of the atmosphere. And they're cleaning methane not just from cows, but from all animals and from swamps and fracking and, and everything. And there just isn't any such thing as waste in nature. Waste happens out of human processes. Um, that, that are linear, but the, nature never created waste. So the, the dung, the urine, the methane coming out of livestock all has an ultimate food source. So, um, you know, it, when it lands on the soil, that, that is a way that nature loves to receive it. And it has loads of mechanisms for absorbing that and reutilizing it. It's when the livestock are in feedlots and the, the urine and the dung blend, then it becomes a toxic substance and it becomes waste. And it's very hard for nature to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um, pick up on something you said, Angus. You said, eat. Eat less meat and dairy if you want to, but don't blame the cows or something to that effect. It's not going to save the planet. No, it's not going to save the planet. What um, <coughs> recently um, Henry Dimbleby came out with the National Food Strategy and his own book called Ravenous, and he, who's not, he's not an extreme man, and he's not saying get rid of cows or everyone become vegan or whatever, but he is saying we need to reduce meat consumption by 30% for two reasons. One is to repurpose the land, to rewild the land, and the other is to exert the cooling effect that you were talking about, uh, Finlow, where you know if we just take the herd size down just a little bit more, we can get that virtual cooling cycle going. I would like to ask the panel what each of you, whether or whoever wants to comment on this, um, do we need to eat less meat? If so, how much less? And if that is the case, how do we stop the eat less meat message being interpreted as everybody go vegan? Can I start off? Um, yes, we do need to eat less meat. I think we need to be clear about that. Um, but it's a question of what kind of meat 
and, um, and, and why we need to do that. And <clears throat> the reason that we need to eat less meat is because the meat industry currently is driven by fossil fuels. It's driven by deforestation. It's driven by biodiversity loss. And so where you have meat which is essentially reliant on imported feed, that is a challenge. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of, there's lots of research that's gone on around this by groups like the Food Farming and Countryside Commission who have taken some research by a, a French NGO called IDRI who did this, this work at European level level then brought it here and um, and I also want to throw into that actually before I, I go into those figures that when the Committee on Climate Change brought its first report out um, three years ago I think it was on agriculture they wanted us to reduce meat and dairy by 80% in this country um, and and it was only because you know people like myself and others went and lobbied them and talked to them and showed them what a nonsense that was that when they issued a report um, then a, a year later it was a bit more nuanced and it was much more like the sort of 30 40 percent then Henry Henry Dimbleby said 30 percent when we're looking at poultry and pigs in the UK most of those uh, animals that we're eating are in heavily feed reliant systems now when we put nuance into this, we're talking potentially about reducing that by about 80%. I mean, you know, we really need to address that or produce those animals in different ways. In terms of ruminants, we certainly do not need to reduce numbers, partly because we're already below net cooling, but partly because they are delivering this important ecosystem function. Now, in the west of the UK, we do have some overstocking, but we don't need to reduce the numbers. We need to move some of those animals across to the east, where there currently aren't uh, many livestock at all, in order that they're part of these cycles that are delivering that nutritional benefit uh, to the soil uh, that Sheila was talking about just, uh, you know, just a little while ago. So. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to touch on was, I, I think that Angus is quite right to, you know, remind us, remind me that it's not just about emissions. And, you know, we've done podcasts, we've talked for a long time, you know, over the course of years about carbon tunnel vision. Carbon tunnel vision is a disease and it stops us getting to the point that we need to be. And this is why land use is so important. Because if we're simply fixated on climate mitigation and emissions, then yeah, there are all kinds of things that we should do. But land is more complicated. We need land to deliver multiple outcomes, not just livelihoods and diets and all that sort of thing. But we need it to restore the biodiversity, to reverse the desertification, not just to mitigate climate change, but to help us adapt to climate change so that we can use our paddocks to hold the water that we need so that we're getting you know, growth during drought situations. We need land to deliver so much. And if we just focus on the carbon, we just focus on the emissions, it gives us a really distorted picture of where we need to be and what we need to be doing. So we need to include these other things as well. Now, I mentioned the IDRI work and the food farming and countryside work, um, and I think that was what I was referring to, where they're saying, in terms of feed, it's, uh, it's a reduction that we're talking about with feed-reliant systems, whether that's a feedlot in the US or whether it's pigs and poultry here. So, as I said at the start, it's the food industry it's the meat industry that's the problem. We need to get back to land and animals being reared on land which is suitable. And if every farmer was producing, whether it was plants or um, livestock, in a way that was suitable to the land that we had, uh, that they had, then we would be on a, a very fast road to restoring some of the crises in nature, some of the problems uh, with the crises in nature that we currently have. Thank you. Julian, can I, if you'd like to comment on this, that's great. I also want to add another question because I've been given the 10 minute signal and I, oh. we can't leave without discussing this. So I'm gonna, please do comment on, on that. But also I'd like to ask you what are the human health considerations that we need to factor into our discussions about the environmental impact of meat and other foods, so. Okay, well, what I was going to say relates to biodiversity and rewilding because um, I was once at a conference probably about 20 years ago and I was amazed that ecologists standing in an upland hay meadow getting really excited because they'd counted over 90 species of plants in this hay meadow and the reason they were there was because of the way the farm had managed that over the last hundred years because to, to cope with the cattle and the sheep that were on, on the farm. 
They had one field that was apparently had to be ploughed out during the war to grow potatoes. And one or maybe it was two years of, of growing potatoes and the biodiversity in those fields was so much less than in the ones that had been left. And so if we are going to a plant-based diet and growing vegetables, we're losing a lot of biodiversity that we would see in, in our um, diverse pastures. And reiterate <laughs> what Finlow says, some of the sickest soils in our country are in arable rotations and they would benefit greatly from a, a forage crop, a grass crop grown in the rotation. And how do you get food from that other than feed livestock? So thank you. Thank very you. Important. Did you want to add something I'll just to follow the around human health? That last point. <laughs> Arable soils in the UK average carbon content, uh, organic matter, um, between 3 and 5%. Livestock soils average carbon content, organic matter, between 8 and 10%. What was the figure you said? How many thousand gallons of water per hectare are held by carbon in the soil? Where's your flood damage? On the arable soils. Grassland solves the problem. But, so I've now got five minutes, or four, right, Sam? Um, and I think they're coming in to clean up and swoop us all out, so we really do have to be out at five, too. Um, yes, I want to go back to where we've all started at this conference, which is what are the human health considerations that we need to factor in when we're talking about the environment? And, and I'll start with you, Gillian, because you work on on this very much with what we feed animals and then how that impacts health. So if you could say something about that. I mean, we, we've heard a few times the importance of the omega-3 fats linked to numerous chronic health conditions, mental and physical health, if we can differentiate them. And if we treat our cows properly, whether they're producing milk or producing meat, then the balance of the, the omega-3 fats in their products is so much better for us. Um, and if it would be much better um, to have a grass-fed steak or some of Angus's ice cream than from an industrial process unit where we... Um, I'm just remembering the figures. Um, we did a study and we bought... Um, sirloin steaks in the supermarket, non-organic, organic. We had some from pasture-fed livestock and we had some from conservation livestock that have been kept with the primary aim of creating biodiversity on um, natural parks and, and, and places like that. And the pasture and the conservation steaks had about two of omega-6 to one of omega-3 Whereas the non-organic from the supermarket, it was about six of omega-6 to one of omega-3. So a huge difference in the ratio. And maybe I should say, just before I pass over the microphone over, if anybody wants some information on that, I have got a couple of copies of, of technical notes with explaining the, the findings. So people can come up and get those yeah. from you. Oh, great, thank you. And would anyone else like to comment on that, the sort of link with the human health? Yep. I think we have two minutes, Sam. Two minutes. Yeah, so plants produce phytonutrients, and phytochemicals have anti-inflammatory, anti-carcinogenic, and cardioprotective qualities that are really beneficial to human health. And when we're eating livestock that are eating biodiverse pasture, they're also getting that concentrated into their meat and milk. And so we, we want to care as much about what we're eating as how it's grown. And I'm just so deeply appreciative of everyone here for caring so much and learning so much. And I want to applaud all of you. And I'm so happy to be here. Oh, that's great. <laughs> It's not about health, but it's just one thing I want to get in before the end, because I think it's really important, because there's a bit of discussion, especially, you know, and I, I read The Guardian, I like The Guardian, I just hate an awful lot of what it says in terms of land use, and there's an awful lot in there, and you talked about rewilding and this idea of rewilding. Now, we have actively degraded nature for decades in this country. If we leave it to nature, 
to sort everything out on our behalf. I, I think, frankly, we're not going to be here in, in 100 years' time. We need to actively regenerate. And this is what ruminants give us the opportunity to do. So it's not about saying, this bit of land we're going to use for rewilding, this bit of land we're going to use for carbon storage for forests, and then we're going to squeeze farming uh, into this other bit. And we're going to produce um, you know, an awful lot of our food from cellular-based protein, which actually there's only, un, only very recently had uh, life cycle analyses done on these things, um, a, 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 a what the impact would be at scale. And, and they found that the emissions linked to cell-based meat are something in the region of four to 25 times worse than beef, which is supposed to be you know, the worst in terms of emissions. So it's not about saying this bit of land for that, this bit of land for that. It's about saying as much land as possible for everything. It's as much land as possible to deliver the climate outcomes, to deliver the forestry outcomes, to deliver the biodiversity outcomes and to make sure that our farmers have a livelihood, they're able to feed their families, they're able to feed us, and that the money that's being made in the countryside is able to cascade and support our urban economies as well. We don't talk about our rural economies, we just let them fade into obsolescence. They are so important for the overall economy of our country. Angus. Angus. Angus, you have 30 seconds. You've got it, yeah. <laughs> and following on from the discussion previous to this, underneath it all, it is the food system that's broken. If it's a plant, you can eat it. If it eats a plant, you can eat it. But if it's made in a plant, for God's sake, <laughs> just don't eat it. I'm, I'm sorry if that felt like a whirlwind tour. It was. Um, but I hope you got a gist of, of what these, these people bring to, to the table in terms of this discussion and the wide range of considerations that they are working with. And I hope that's uh, left you feeling a little bit better about the whole issue. Thank you. <laughs>